Hello everyone and welcome back to the COM350 office here in my home. I apologize for not getting this video out until today. Yesterday after I finished teaching my class I went home or I went to my office at the at the school and I sat down to record your video for you and realized I had no voice. So even today I'm still sounding a little bit gurgly and raspy and I apologize for that but that is why I could not get this video to you before this morning. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to read uh, your Isocrates reading assignment for Tuesday. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about what we should glean from that. And then I'm going to prepare you for reading Phaedrus if you haven't started already. Sometimes going into the reading with some idea of what you're looking for is helpful. And Phaedrus is not easy. And I acknowledge that. So let's get started though with Isocrates and his two works, which if you say them together sort of rhyme, uh, against the sophists and antidosis, uh, that's how I remember Isocrates as well as I do. You don't need to have them at the tip of your tongue, but I usually have to. Uh, why is he important? Who was he? Well, I mean, we know he was a sophist uh, from what you read, you know that. He was a sophist who didn't really like what the sophists were doing. In that sense, he was sort of like Plato um, in some way, because he thought that the sophists were taking money. Um, they were, in fact, way, way, in his opinion, off you know the range as far as being ethical. They would make false promises. They made promises where they said, hey, we're going to teach you how to get yourself out of this situation. And the problem with that was is that they taught them how to get out of one specific situation and not actually practice the ethics and, and the rules of rhetoric. So they were considered lawyers and teachers because they would charge people to speak for them and they would charge people to teach them but both of those things only got them out of one situation. And there may have been multiple situations that people needed to get out of or needed to work with or needed to defend themselves or to attack someone else. And that just ended up costing them a lot of money that Isocrates did not think it should cost. He felt we should teach people how to practice rhetoric and how to understand rhetoric for as, as an educational exercise so that they can use it whenever they go out into the world and they can use it a second time. Lawyers make you pay every time that you have uh, a, a case with them, right? There's always a pretty large sort of down payment known as the retainer and then there's a lot of costs that come after that depending on the, the, the strength or the length and the complexity of your case. And so Isocrates complained about that. And Isocrates complained about charging people to, cheat, to teach them only certain things, not the entirety of practicing rhetoric. So that is, uh, th those are the two main criticisms from Isocrates when we read against the sophists. But it's important to remember that he was one. And the reason why it's important to remember that is because of his second work, Antidosis. Now we know that Antidosis uh, means, well, we don't necessarily know this, I'm trying to tell you this, that Antidosis is sort of like antidote, right? That's where the word comes from. Um, and antidote, of course, it, it protects you or it responds to poisoning, right? So something bad has entered your body, we give you the antidote for it. Um, there's a problem in the community, we provide a solution or an antidote to solve the problem. So why did he write this piece called Antidosis? Well, it is a defense. It is the rhetoric of defense here that we are looking at because he was being attacked. What was he being attacked for? Well, people said that, you know, back then you used to build a ship or provide a building or donate money somewhere spectacular um, and he's even built a statue or a monument and he said that's a ridiculous way 
to um, quote unquote, make yourself important to the community. Um, and so he just wasn't giving enough money. And they said, we don't understand. You're a sophist. Give us what sophists normally give us. Give us a ship for war. Give us a, a building. Give us something. And so because he didn't want to do that, that was one of the attacks against him. Another attack against him was the same attack that was, you know, posited towards Socrates, which was, you're corrupting our youth. Now, what did they mean by corrupting the youth at this time? Well, it meant that they were talking about how to gain power in the community and move through the ranks through education, particularly the education of rhetoric. This was a problem. This was a problem because when you teach students to think for themselves or to think critically, they might make choices you don't like. For example, I'll use myself because I never like to call anybody else out and I don't know you all yet, but for myself, my mother raised four of us. Um, there was my sister, there's me, there's my brother John, and there's my brother Patrick. <clears throat> Me and Patrick took off in the sense that when we decided that we were going to go on and further our education, um, we chose to move away from, the, from Pittsburgh. Now, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has a lot of great universities, um, and there's no doubt about that. But I wanted to go to a smaller liberal arts college where I could sort of like expand my way of thinking beyond the southwestern Pennsylvania corner, um, West Virginia and Ohio tri-state area. So I actually went to Cleveland, 110 miles from home. Um, it wasn't like I went off into a, a different world. But as I learned there, I opened up my mind a little bit to different courses of study. And I started to realize that if I really wanted to craft uh, my career, I needed to move to other regions of the country in order to learn. And so that's what I did. And um, I also didn't get married until I was 40. And um, I'm not the best practicing Catholic. So all of these values that my mother had um, and my father had and tried to instill in me, apparently I have just violated all of them, right? Um, my, my husband and I and my kids didn't always sit down to dinner together. We don't pray in my house. Um, these are severe violations, I think, in my mother's mind. Uh, no, no matter how good of a person I am, she believes that I went off the range. Uh, my brother Patrick moved to DC, but he got married at the right age and he had kids and he did everything right. My brother John stayed. In, in the area, did everything right. My sister stayed in the area. Um, and even though she's single and didn't do the traditional thing that we did in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, she definitely stayed close to mom. I took off. I, I'm a thousand miles away. What's that have to do with anything with Isocrates? Well, the reason that I'm a thousand miles away, the reason that I have damaged the family structure or left the community that I was raised in is because I learned other things. And so it gives you a drive to want to move up in the world. When you learn, it means you want to better the community that you live in and therefore better yourself or change. This concept of change, while very difficult for my own mother, is a microcosmic sort of example of what happens on the grand level. And I'm very passionate about this right now. And the reason I'm passionate about this right now is because here in Christian County, just south of, of Greene County, just south of the university, last night, our library board, I wasn't there, but this is what I'm told. Our library board posed a whole coup replaced their president without any reason um, and put two church leaders on the board who are now vowing 
to remove books from our public libraries and label them and rate them because putting books in the children's section versus an adult section versus a teen section isn't enough. And they define these books that are talking about uh, gender or exploitation, teaching students about experiences they may already be having, but that they may encounter in life, they're taking those books off the shelf based on their moral values, as they say. And that is devastating because what we're doing is removing educational opportunity. And therefore, we're not investing in our students. We're worried about our personal um, issues. Now, Isocrates said, I'm not corrupting the youth. I'm helping them learn how to move on in life. I want them to think differently from me. We want them to do better than us so that we progress as a society. And therefore, he said, I'm not going to build you some statue or worship or whatever it is that you want. I am going to invest in my students. And so I don't have money because any money that I had, I put, I put back into my school. I put back into my students and that is my investment in the future. Not, I mean, buildings fall, statues crumble, uh, warships get destroyed in war. Um, and so it's really important that I invest in something living. And that was his defense for, quote, corrupting the youth and for, quote, not spending money um, on these extravagant things that other people at the time, other teachers, other sophists were doing. So I hope that helps a little bit. I'm sorry I went on a little rant there, but I am greatly concerned for Southwest Missouri right now. Um, and if I, if I don't laugh about the absurdity of it, I would cry. It, it's really astonishing that we are still learning the lessons from 2,400 years ago. I'm baffled. <laughs> so th this work from, from my Socrates, I reread Antidosis a lot to remind myself that, you know, this, was, this has been a part of the human condition, that anyone who introduces something new, a change, an idea. And this is not just in Southwest Missouri, obviously, or even Southwest Pennsylvania. This is as ancient as 400 BCE. Okay. It's ancient. This idea that education ruins children. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to know that it's a 2,500 year battle. And last night, I mean, I know I've been fighting it for, for two years now here in Nixa with the schools, and I knew they were going to move on to the public libraries, and that is just a, a bridge too far for me. Um, so that is a battle that I will be taking on. I can't say I'm going to be using Isocrates for reference because nobody knows who he is, but now you understand um, that this debate, this, this question of, of the role of education in our lives is old. How does this relate to rhetoric? Well, first of all, Isocrates was a teacher of rhetoric, that's obvious, but in addition, he's practicing rhetoric here, right? He's writing a defense. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, against the sophist was rhetoric of accusation, right? He was actually accusing the the other sophists of the time the teachers of rhetoric at the time and he was saying here's everything that's wrong with you he attacked them and then in the next work that we read it's a defense it's what's known as apologia apology with an ie at the end instead of a y is that, or an ia at the end is apologia that's the uh i believe greek word maybe it's the latin word um, for, for apology. And what he's doing is not apologizing, he's rhetorically constructing apologia 
and taking on the fact that he has been attacked and he needs to defend himself. So when we say apologia, we are talking about a defense, right? The rhetoric of defense, really more than anything else. So those are our two pieces from Isocrates. I know I went on a much longer than I usually do about Isocrates, but uh, it, it seems relevant because right now, all communities, especially in Missouri, need to be concerned about the education of their future and their community. And I don't ever tell anybody which way to think on that. Um, I just tell people to think about it um, whatever, and do something if you want to. Um, if you want to remove books from shelves, go fight for that. If you don't want books removed from shelves, please go fight for that. Whatever it is that you want to do, I would uh, tell you to be like Isocrates. And instead of just, uh, well, I mean, writing letters to the editor, newspaper articles, um, submissions, uh, social media, these are all ways that we can become active in these debates and these struggles. But just know that you're engaging in a 2,400 year old debate. Okay, hopefully that was easy to read. Phaedrus, not easy to read. And I always apologize for it for some reason and I'm not sure why. Maybe I feel guilt um, that, you know, it's so difficult. But your book has really trimmed down the edited section that it gives you. It no longer makes you read 200 pages, I don't think, of, of Phaedrus. Of course, Phaedrus is written by Plato and it gets confusing because it's a dialogue. So he writes this dialogue. Basically, it's like reading a play without stage direction, right? It's you're reading a conversation. And in that conversation, we have three main characters. The first character is Phaedrus. He is a student and he is studying under the second character. Now, Plato names the second character Socrates. I'll talk about that in a minute. The third character is Lysias, L-Y-S-I-A-S. -S. Lysias is a, a rhetorician. So back then we didn't have newspapers, we didn't have radios, we didn't have any mass communication at all whatsoever, except that people would go and listen to the Senate or the, the governing bodies, whichever one it was, and they would go from town to town repeating the arguments that they heard. They did not memorize the speeches word for word. Instead, they took the main ideas and what was important in those speeches, memorized those, remembered those, and then they stepped into um, going to different towns and delivering this message. And that's how messages got sent. Could you imagine how long we would have to wait to find out who the new president was if we were still in that situation? That would be difficult. Um, I'm kind of glad I wasn't around then. Um, but these rhetoricians, as they were called, they would go around and repeat the ideas of what was coming from the government. So that was how the government communicated with the citizens. That's important. So a rhetorician then, according to Aristotle, who we'll get to later, a rhetorician is someone who understands how to communicate the government to the citizens, to the people, okay? Um, and that's why people still analyze speeches from presidents or from um, Congress or um, from ranking officials. Uh, that's why we still study this stuff, is because that is the job of a rhetorician, because while it is true that rhetoric can happen anywhere, and I've talked about studying and analyzing movies and song lyrics and things like that, it is because it's on a mass level. Plato had a real problem with this, and Aristotle believed that was what rhetoric was supposed to do. So, first Plato, what you need to know about the word Socrates, the name, the person, we don't really know much about him. 
Um, we know actually a lot more about I, Socrates, than we know about Socrates, to be honest with you. But whenever he is used in a dialogue, because, I mean, we're pretty sure Socrates was dead by the time this, this dialogue came out. So Socrates is a character. And if you read a lot of this ancient Greek uh, philosophy, if you read a lot of it, it's a, a lot of it is written in dialogue. And Socrates is sort of the representation of wisdom, okay? So whenever we see the name Socrates, we know that that is the smartest person uh, in this work. That's who's going to be made um, to be representing the true argument. In this case, Plato is speaking through Socrates' voice. So we have these three characters, Lysias the great speaker, Phaedrus the great student, and Socrates, the great teacher. Lysias delivers a speech. It's a speech about whether or not you should learn from people you love or learn from people you don't love. I'm not gonna lie to you, sometimes when I was in college and well, particularly grad school um, at Mizzou, some of my professors would just be so engaging and smart and powerful in front of the classroom that it becomes a, attractive because power is attractive. And I, by attractive, I don't mean that in a romantic way. I mean that like in the sense that humans are drawn to it. So male or female, I had professors who um, attracted me more than others because they engaged us differently because they were particularly charismatic um, or, yeah, I said the whole word charismatic, by the way, this whole Riz thing, I, I hope that's a, a really quickly gone phase. Um, they were very charismatic. They were engaging to the point that I would give them power to teach me. And this is something that uh, Plato was very aware of. And he was fearful that it would be abused. And so he's, there's a lot going on in Phaedrus because Socrates, apparently the character Socrates, was very interested in his students sexually, um, is the argument. And so this speech about, uh, from Lysias about whether you should learn from someone you love or from someone you're, that you don't love, um, is, is interesting. It's created by Plato. It didn't actually happen. Um, it's created by Plato for the purpose of writing this piece. So if that hasn't confused you enough, Phaedrus comes back to Plato, or comes back to Socrates, excuse me, and he says to his teacher, I just heard the best speaker and the greatest speech. And Socrates says, well, what was it? Give it to me. And so Phaedrus sort of engages in practicing rhetoric in that he repeats the, the, the speech that Lysias had given. And Socrates says, oh, pff, I could deliver that speech easily. And he engages that speech. And he argues that you should learn from someone that you love. And then he says, but here's the real problem. And then he delivers the speech again. Yes, this is not easy to read. He delivers the speech again, proving that you should learn from someone you don't love. And that is one of Plato's complaints about rhetoric. And he has Socrates demonstrate that in rhetoric, you must be careful because you're creating a power situation where you are influencing the audience on a grand scale audience that's going to be affected by your speech. And so there's a great deal that can go wrong. Most rhetoricians, practicing rhetoricians, uh, they can argue both sides of an argument. They can tell you that uh, the lighting in my video today is excellent, and they could tell you that it's absolutely terrible. Both will provide a solid argument and good persuasive techniques for both. And he said that is a slippery slope because it leads to his biggest complaint about rhetoric, Plato's 
biggest complaint. Rhetoric changes or hides the truth. And this, in, this practice of this, dis, this discourse, this dialogue that you're reading is to demonstrate what's wrong with rhetoric. And that's one. One of the problems with rhetoric is that it hides the truth. Another problem with rhetoric is that you can argue that something is good and bad at the same exact time. And Plato has Socrates say that that's a bad practice. Um, number three, his third argument was that rhetoric could be used for trickery. It could make you believe something that's not true. That's absolutely, by the way, always true. You can always tell a lie. Now Aristotle's going to answer that later, and so for your next week's or for Thursday's video, I'm going to talk more about that. But for Phaedrus, you need to go into it knowing that you're reading a work where Socrates does not like rhetoric, but wants to seduce his uh, his student. His student is enamored with Lysias because Lysias gave this great speech. And they engage in a debate, a dialogue about what rhetoric does at that point. A little bit of background on Plato and why he is important um, for rhetoric and why I mentioned truth. And that is this, I'm, I apologize. Um, I had to look at something really quickly. Uh, so, what, what, why is Plato important to rhetoric? There, there are some philosophies of Plato that we don't even touch on that are actually important, but that would be a lot of reading. So let me give you the rundown. Plato was what we call an idealist, meaning that he believed that there was an ideal form of everything ideal form, perfect form of everything. But it existed in a world that he called the noumenal world. N-O-U-M-E-N-A-L, noumenal world. No one knows where this noumenal world is, when we experienced it, if it was before we were born, if it was while we were being born, if it was when we were kids, if it's in a dream, we don't know. But he says there's an ideal form of everything, and it is the truth. So the perfect form of something is the truth of something. Now, he says that, and he says that philosophers are always trying to attain the good, the truth. But he says that we can't attain it here on earth because everything is a bastardized form of that ideal form, right? So like there's this ideal chair, that is the truth of chairs uh, somewhere that has been experienced. And yet every chair that we produce is a bastardization trying to get closer to that ideal truth. I'm using that as a very simplistic example, obviously. But if that's the case, he says, then what rhetoric does is it takes another step away from the truth. So we have this true, perfect thing. On earth, we have its imperfect thing, its imperfect model, trying to attain that perfection. And then if I just describe that perfection to you, now we're even further away from the truth. And that's how rhetoric hides the truth. So that's sort of this like three or four step process to get to rhetoric. This chair is not that comfortable. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm describing it to you. I might be able to communicate to you what this chair is like, maybe. I can't have you experience it, but I can have a description of it. But that's not the truth, right? Because the actual chair is the truth. No, the actual chair is a bastardization of the true form of a chair, a perfect chair, 
which is the truth. So we take all these steps away from the actual truth of what it is that we're trying to speak about. And that's why in Phaedrus we get this list of problems with rhetoric. Because Socrates, who's representing Plato here, explains that exact thing in a very long and difficult dialogue. <laughs> so I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you if you don't read every word, you're not going to understand. You will. Um, if you read the introduction, that'll be helpful to you. Um, and then if you do go that step, and I won't say it's an extra step because it's assigned, but if you go that step to reading it, hopefully knowing this going into it will help you out a little bit. So what do we have so far? We have a definition of rhetoric that we haven't even gotten to yet, right? The art or skill of knowing in any particular instance, all the means of persuasion, that comes from Aristotle. We know that the first work that we really define as rhetoric is from Gorgias, and that what he is attempting to do is to defend someone's honor, and he's also enjoying it. He, he's appreciating the exercise of defending Helen. So we know that rhetoric can be enjoyable. We know that it can sort of rehabilitate um, someone's history. And uh, we don't know whether that's good or bad, but we enjoy it. Plato comes along and says, <laughs> or Isocrates comes along and says, well, here's how you use rhetoric to attack. And here's how you use rhetoric to defend. And because of that, Aristotle will come up with three, three contexts or three genres of rhetoric that I'll get to when we get to Aristotle. And then we have Plato who says, hey guys, um, this isn't a good thing. Can we, can we stop doing this? Rhetoric is bad. Rhetoric hides the truth. It mutates and blends good and evil to be the same thing. That's bad. Plato also says at one point, it's not in your book, so I'm just going to tell you this, that what we really need is not a democracy. Plato did not advocate for a democracy. He advocated for a monarchy that was led by, get this, a philosopher king. And the philosopher king knew the truth, had done all of the work to know the truth. Everybody else was just practicing rhetoric. And he was really trying to say philosophy is more important than rhetoric here. And guess who Plato believed made good philosopher king? That's right, Plato. <laughs> Plato argued that only he could really rule over the land. Uh, kind of idealistic, as is normal for Plato, but also a little bit arrogant, <laughs> I would say, more than a little bit perhaps, but he did not believe that many people could, should be, should be in the role of governing others. Um, he believed in one person telling the truth, whatever, however that was defined. So keep in mind that Plato was an idealist. Plato was someone who believed that there should be one ruler and it should be a philosopher that he felt he was probably that philosopher and that all of rhetoric was bad. Now, when you read Phaedrus, you might read pieces that make you think, oh, he thinks rhetoric is good. That's the part where he's, try he's trying to demonstrate that, where Plato's trying to demonstrate that rhetoric can be called good and rhetoric can proven to be, be bad. And so it could be proven to be both. So please don't get confused and think that Plato likes rhetoric. All right. That catches us up until Thursday, tomorrow for the week. And when we come back on Thursday, uh, I will hopefully um, not do too much more on Phaedrus and introduce you to our next guest, who is, in fact, Aristotle. Very excited about it. Uh, keep reading, and if you need anything, please let me know. Um, oh, last thing, the assignment that I kept referring to apparently in my last video, I apologize for that. It is actually up 
Now, on Bright, Brightspace, it's, it's not a huge deal. Um, I just want you to write about what your impressions of rhetoric are. You don't have to cite any evidence. This is about you and your experience and what you think the word rhetoric means, what you think it is, um, before we get too far into the study of rhetoric. And everybody has a different idea of what it is. So I'm just interested in knowing what your thoughts are. So really just like two paragraphs maybe, not a whole lot, um, and, and it's worth 100 points. So I'm trying to give you an early start on getting a tenth of your grade. <laughs> so it will be basically evaluated on not the content so much as, as your writing. Uh, because obviously if, if everybody's right and nobody can be wrong, that's fine. I'm going to grade your writing. So if you are concerned about that in some way, please, by all means, read my rubric that's available to you um, for papers, but you don't have to go that deep into it. This is a formal response to an academic practice, so please don't use your Twitter voice or your TikTok voice or any of those things to write. Um, make it more formal than that. That's, that's all I ask. And let me know what you think rhetoric is. And that is up. All right, everybody, sorry for the delay. Hopefully there won't be a delay tomorrow. My throat hopefully will come back and my voice will probably come back hopefully tomorrow. Lots of tea and I will, I'll, I'll talk to you soon.